Hi, this is David Sable again for Creativity from the Other Side, brought to you by New York Festivals, where we talk to the most interesting people in our industry, the most interesting people associated with creativity of all sorts, to learn from them what drives their creativity, what drives their motivation, what gets them out of bed every morning, and why is it that we're just absolutely astounded and drawn in by the work that they do. And today, I'm so excited to speak with Dorte spengler Ahrens, who is the chairwoman of Jung van Matt and the president of the ADC. That is the, just for those who don't know, it's the Art Directors Council or the Art Directors Club, which is very, very important and very powerful in our industry. And for those who don't know, and please feel free to go look it up, Jung van Matt is one of the most famous agencies in Germany. It is one of the primo agencies in the world. And it just when you look at award shows and you look at work that people respect and are interested in, um, Jung van Matt is just really, really at the top of the list, an agency that I know very well from my years working with German companies. So Dorte, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk to you, to have you on the show and just to share some thoughts with you. Um, thank you so much for this introduction. I, I always feel like, um, how to say, a little bit shy, like, oh, this this incredible uh, person you're talking about, is this me? <laughs> so thank you for making me, uh, yeah, humble. So let's begin. Uh, first, before we get into, into some of the more serious things, tell me about Tyson. <laughs> Tyson uh, is the family dog, and he was when he was a, a baby, a puppy, uh, he was biting in everything, just like what puppies do. And uh, so my little son said, "Look, mom, he's like uh, Ty Mike Tyson. He he was biting the ear of Evander Holyfield." And then we were laughing loud, and then we said, "Okay, his name is Tyson." And of course, now he's big; it's a big um, German dog. Uh, but um, he's not biting everybody. It's just like the name when he that's, was. That's good. I'm glad he's not biting everybody. So one of the things that one of the things that you talk about, just in terms of of your personal life, is that the most important things to you would be work, family, travel, and meeting people. And if you can do them all at the same time, you've said that would be your absolute goal. Yes, that's true. The funny fun fact is that my husband was always my biggest competitor. He was always working in agencies uh, um, who were competing with us, as you from what, so it was Spring on Jakobi. And lately he opened up uh, Ingo, which is a international known brand, a boutique um, brand, um, agency for Ogilvy before and different others. And he always was competing in cars. So I had a Mercedes, he was working for Audi and I worked for Audi and he was BMW and I worked for BMW and he worked and now and so on. So now I'm very happy as a chairwoman that um, they want me for, uh, yeah, client relationships, uh, things uh, interested to bring for, uh, how to say, to emphasize on, on topics like women, yeah, in our um, business in Germany, it's like 13%, which is really ridiculous, and so on. So uh, since he was always competing with me, and we had a little son, the dog came later. Uh, it was a good thing because uh, when he was in travel, I was the mom and, and, and the other way around. So we were kind of a creative family. Uh, and so he understood what I'm doing and was not, um, yeah, nagging on that. And your son, Bella, is he going to follow you both into the industry? What do you think? No, the fun, again, funny is Bela is a, a guy who um, fell in love with online business. My, some of my biggest clients, what I, I made them with our campaign, we made them famous was Zalando, which is a huge company now worldwide for online uh, shoe, shoe sale, no fashion. So he kind of liked it. He, he saw that, uh, of course, as the young generation, online is it. And uh, so he fell in love with that. And now he goes to the school, so in, in university, private school, where all the founders were. So again, <laughs> it's kind of part. I'm very happy he's not an advertiser and doesn't want to be that. So uh, 
thank God and thank God he's not a kind of, I don't know, weird kind of profession he's following. He wants to become an online entrepreneur. So let's just talk a little bit about your career and then we'll get into, into Jung van Matt. Um, so first of all, one of the things I, I neglected to say is that in 2018, you were on the executive jury of New York Festival. So we thank you for that. And I remember that year. It was a very, very good year for judging and for work. Um, so your connection to us and to creativity from the side is very close in and, and personal. But just from, from your own perspective, um, you started, and I, I found this fascinating, you started learning arts, you started from a visual communications perspective, you became an art director, and then you became a copywriter. So talk to us a little bit about that. I think it's fascinating for people who are thinking about where do they fit in, in the industry, and the ability to move from one side to the other. First of all, uh, I think it's a, it's great that in our companies, especially I did that, so if I see a talent more in that field than the other, I try to to talk about it and tell the person that I think that she's or he is more talented in, or maybe that there's there are some strengths in that. And um, sometimes they follow the advice. And same with me. I, I was uh, an art director. I went to, to study communication, visual, visual communication. And then I found out <laughs> in my first jobs that the guys or girls who were the copywriters always wrote down the concept. So they had the thinking about what the concept is. And so and not only headlines, but all the, the frame, everything you needed to frame with, with wording. And the visual part was kind of later. And uh, I, I I love to write concepts myself. And I found art direction also interesting, but I noticed that my strength is thinking, create a uh, strategy, creative strategy and uh, yeah, and writing. So that's how I, I promised and I convinced my bosses uh, to let me change the sides. So, and then I, and as a creative director, I don't know how it's in, uh, everywhere else, but, but with us, it's like, you have to be very good in both disciplines and uh, yeah, to do it and also to judge it. So the, the kind of separation of your profession is, um, how to say, um, over. So you have to do I, it. I all. find that, I find that so interesting because, you know, I started as a copywriter, okay. but also learned I was never an art director, but I started as a copywriter, but I'm very visual. And so I, and I learned back in the day before we had computers to, to do our visualization, I learned paste up. I learned typography. I learned all of the aspects of creating an ad. And because that way, when I wrote, I could visualize headlines and, te and text and where they might be. So I think this notion of being able to visualize is very important in our industry. So I think that maybe that's just a lesson for all copywriters or people who start on the art side, but really it's not really what they want to do, or maybe they're just visualizers like me and not real art directors. And that maybe that's an opportunity to flip them. So I think that's really good. Sometimes it's an advantage to to know uh, something about the other disciplines because uh, I have always like you a very strong visual vision, so I I, I feel how it should like look like, and uh, I try to make myself clear how I would like to do it. Or we are in a discussion what the art director says, but I can always make a very poor. <laughs> <laughs> scribble but uh, just to, to get across what um yeah what i want to how, how i would love to have to, to have that visual the visualization and this is very helpful as you say that if you know something or typography i can still uh yeah i learned this yeah um so yeah, i think kind of, there's another aspect kind of very, yeah. it's also very interesting and and maybe important for people because it's very unusual um to find it in people who are in big agencies. And again, the reason I'm so interested is because I did very similar. You're an entrepreneur. You started an agency, right? Back in 2000, Maria. You came back 
to Jung van Maat, but inside Jung van Maat, you were an entrepreneur, if you will. So you created new businesses inside. And again, I think that's just a fascinating way to grow a career, but to but specifically to drive a vision of creativity. Yeah, um, it was, some people could say, what, you're such a long time at the same agency, this must be boring, yeah. And I would say, no, it's, it was not because as you say, uh, after some years there, I was uh, very uh, fast, I became a creative director. And then I opened up the first women's agency <laughs> for uh, female products, but not only also, I mean, every buying decision is taken by women. So we kind of, we were open and we were just having female employees and we started together. So this was an adventure. But I found out after a year that uh, I missed my big clients. I had Audi, I had the German biggest newspaper, I had this German savings bank and so, and I was always women's magazines and baking cookies. And I said, I can't. So the market was not uh, like it is today there yet. So female um, products were limited to hygiene articles like, yeah, tampons and so on. So I went back and then uh, next interesting thing happened or not interesting, fantastic, my son. Um, and uh, I gave birth to my son and then I was the first employee of Jung Format who, who got a home office with uh, internet and, and uh, computers. And I worked from there and I opened up an international, what was for, is for Germany, really uh, something completely new at that time with only international um, creatives. So from China to South America, everybody, every nation we had and were kind of the secret weapon of my boss, Jean-Marie Format. So he said, okay, this new business we have to win or we need some creative excellence, uh, super extra work and so and that was my task. So the, the thing was, uh, with this job, uh, I did not need to jump on the plane every morning at five to travel to Cologne or wherever to my clients. I could sit there and develop great things with my teams. And it was for me totally inspiring, interesting, because it was completely unusual at that time to work strictly and only with international talent yeah yeah and then came different agencies i always had clients i want clients and uh fun fact um new format is named after river so there's new format elbe which is in hamburg or alster or in berlin it's the spree so it's even in our branches in korea and in china we are called like the the, the big rivers in the cities are and uh, so this was a kind of a big law. But then one day I said, mm, I feel I would like to have my name on the door. And they're like, hey, don't you know where you are? So, yeah. And then they made a compromise. So Spengler Ahrens, my husband, my husband, I was about to say, my partner at the time was Mr. Giest. So S, uh, Spengler Ahrens, S-A-G for Giest and agency uh, uh, was Saga. Saga is a Swedish term for the story so it's, if you have a saga around you this is more than your uh, the facts is the, how you are it's like and he said we, we do it for brands it's not storytelling but it's we create sagas for brands and that's what i liked about and they they liked it too so this was a little revolutionary for this agency i'm not a river i have a name yeah yeah, and then came the, the next level was, uh, as you said, um, I became chairwoman, which is completely unusual for Germany. I think I'm the only one in the agency landscape. And uh, I have completely new tasks. And I don't know how it's your in professional life. Um, normally, you have jobs the whole, the whole day. It's one meeting after the other. And now I have the task to invent what I want to do. Yeah, so... <laughs> What top topic I want to move forward and uh, yeah, so this is a very interesting part again. So you obviously, as I, I was so impressed by your wonderful, stunning career, but you jump more between different things, and I'm like I'm here for twenty seven years now, yeah, which is strange, but cool. Right, it's still, yeah, but it's not a it's not a linear twenty seven, even though the. Jung van Matt might be linear. I think, again, what you did is very similar to what I did. It's yeah. just I did it inside Jung and Rubicam and then WPP. 
and I was able to move, although I did go out and start an internet company at one point, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I think that the lesson is don't be, you know, don't feel so comfortable to sit in a chair for 27 yeah. years. Like no. think about, think about moving and what you can do and right. how you can, and what, what more you can bring, which brings me to, I, one of the things that I liked is just your vision for Jung van Maat. And I think that, I just wrote some of them down, um, which I found to be really interesting. So you start talking about, and maybe you can just speak to some of them, but you start talking about creative innovation, how important that is. This is sort of in your list of 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 in, of important things called the vision or the mission or whatever. Gender equality. So you talked that you had the first, you know, women's agency and the first woman chairperson, which I think is amazing. You talk about talent and the need to grow talent inside but also to look outside to help and how do you balance that and then you talk about mentorship which i love that you added that because i think it's something that we don't do enough of these days i know here at, at stagwell we're we're really leaning into that in a big way but i think in general it's something that used to be and you just don't see it as much. If I told you how many calls I get a week and how many LinkedIn messages I get from young people in the industry, you say, yeah. you be my mentor. And it's yeah. like, I'd love to, but I can't be everybody's mentor. And I don't, it's just what upsets me that they have to do that is because nobody in their company has reached out to them and said, we're going to mentor you. So I love that you've put that down as one of your key principles. Yeah, uh, it's a personal thing, I must say. Of course, in our agency, we have wonderful mentorship programs for women. Sorry. <laughs> um, because in oh, my uh, in, in my experience, men are kind I don't say automatically, but they, uh, how to say, have less needs to be mentored. Do they mentored or mentorized? <laughs> yeah, mentored, that's fine. Yeah, uh, mentors. Yeah, so uh, they they have much more self confidence, and a lot of a, a big part of my mentorships for women is to um, tell them how good they are, to give them the courage to to move on. And um, one day, it was my one of my female employees, and I I forced her to become creative director. I really said, "You have to do that now, and I will." Do it. You become now creative director, if you want or not. And in three months, you can tell me uh, if you still don't like it, and then you can go back to your old position. So I think I, I have a strong. Um, I feel it, and I want it. I want to to uh, encourage it's a lot of empowerment um, to to make women believe in themselves and to go the next steps. And uh, that's cool. It was my new position. I have even more time. I'd always do also do this for the. I'm the first female president of the German uh, Art Directors Club, and um, we started with 150 members, and now we're 360, which is very very important for us. You can't imagine that in our country, we have not as in America and other parts of the world a kind of equality. Uh, we have um, fifty percent or sixty percent of um, the young generations in agencies is female, and then the more the hierarchy gets up, suddenly you are alone as a woman in the partnerships or wherever you look at um, in in our um, in the creative um, surroundings. It's like that. Not on the client side, there are female leaders. Uh, in, in the big uh, BMW and other big brands, they have female leaders, but not in our. And this is uh, a pity because there are so many talents around. And as you say, I, I get the same emails like you uh, or and I always try to to help or to, to I, I opened up a mentorship program in the art director stuff with uh, and a lot of famous German efforts advertisers are in there and you can write them an email and ask if they would mention them so as as you I strongly believe in this and it's for them very often to, to, totally helpful even if you have only a time as a superstar like you and you give them give them so how to say um advice 
that helps them to deal with their problems or to 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 in, uh, empower them to to go the next step so it's so cool that you do this oh i hear you eh? and it's really again i think it's just another lesson for us for everybody who's listening i mean it's one of the things that we pay forward by mentoring others and i think that the mentoring comes back to all the other things that you talk about the notion of, of gender equality the notion of growing talent um, of creativity, I think mentoring is a place where we can really impact everything else in in the biggest way. So we all know that in our business, um, certainly people like us are addicted to the pitch, and you know it becomes a <laughs> it's it's as as crazy as it is, and as nuts as they make us, and as much as we curse it sometimes when we're in it, it is an addiction. And I think that you wrote some really amazing rules for pitching that <laughs> I, I loved, and I want you just to share them with everybody. So I'll just read some of that, and then you can just you know talk to the things. One of the things you said: "There's no grouches, no grouches," and then you follow that by saying "no ego." And I thought about that, and it's actually very true because the grouches are usually the ones who have the biggest ego. They're complaining Absolutely. because they're the ones who feel that they shouldn't be doing this in quite the same way that the rest of us do. So just like build on that a little bit. I think the biggest problem you can have with pitches is fear. So if you are afraid to lose and try your best not to lose, that's probably the best way to lose. Um, you have to to um, have this perfect mix out of courage, be brave, have great ideas, but absolutely, absolutely have the right feeling. If my husband always calls a sweet spot, what is the client able, capable to accept as a courageous solution? Or uh, how 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 to say how simple must it be? Or uh, but it should not be too simple. So this is all this the dilemma you have the whole time to to judge uh, also how you treat the clients. If you are doing this, what we did in Germany over hundreds of years, uh, or you are very in a way self conscious, but you could be too self conscious. So all this perfect uh, balance of how to to deal with these um, people, which are of course the guys who will uh, take the decision uh, until uh, and also for your team how you lead them through it I think that's that's one of the most challenging um, tasks and I I'm totally happy that I had the chance to do a lot of new business and I want some <laughs> so one of the things you also say about the pitch which I found to be really true and interesting mostly we're all equal until the pitch. So everybody's presenting and everybody's showing work and everybody's making the chemistry and da, 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 da. But the pitch is that that's the final moment. So you might have a level playing field, but that's the place where you can actually distinguish yourself in a different way. Yeah. That's a really tough thing. And we try to... Um to kind of perfectionize with that, or that but obviously it doesn't uh, um it's not successful every time <laughs> um but you we try to be um but this, this is a strongly belief and i don't know how to say that in english uh to have a in germany you say you have a pure heart that means you are true that means right. you never sell a client something what you are not convinced of you you find you do work very hard in your uh, thinking the best solution and you are convinced of it because you checked all uh, how to say every every aspect of it and uh, of course it's a little bit more courageous the client probably was expecting but that's that's why they call us and then you have to be uh, ein reines Herz a pure heart a heart um, which is you are not lying you are not selling you are convinced by that, what you say, and you believe in it. And I always say to my my people, if they call you at night and you are like, ah, the first thing you would say is the truth and that it must be that level. It must be 
the truth. And sometimes clients have a feeling for this and, and they like it and they say, oh yeah, that's cool. I have an honesty in our relationship and uh, I, I prefer to have an honest consultant than to somebody who wants to sell me something. So I've always believed that in agencies, you know, one of the mistakes that we make is that we think we call people creators as if nobody else is creative. And, you know, obviously going into a pitch and when a team comes together, everybody's creative in their own way. Even the financial people need to be because there's, there's a strategy to the finance that you bring to a new business pitch. And I think that one of the things, again, that struck me in your philosophy is that you have to inspire throughout. It's not just the creative, i.e. the asset creation at the end, the big idea or the videos or the event or the activation that creates the creative inspiration, but throughout you have to be. Yeah, totally. Um, I was always, uh, I, I learned a lot from my mentors and from the uh, great people around me and the first um, work uh, I stumbled upon in this agency when I started here was um, a striking title. Uh, you are a copywriter, you know what I mean? The title of a presentation very often decides if you're like that, this or this. And uh, it was the uh, forgotten, or what's it? Uh, what's the translation? What has milliard of English? Uh, billion, the forgotten billion. And it was for the German Savings Bank, which is a huge, big company, the forgotten billion. And uh, it was a great moment. They just took photographs of the branches because they have tons of, in every city, you have like 100, do you say branches of sparkhouses? So there are so many like shops and they have shop windows. Yeah. And they don't advertise in these windows. That's weird, but it was true. And uh, my boss said the title was The Forgotten Billion. And he showed the, the uh, member of the boards the fact that they have thousands of kilometers, square kilometers of advertising space and they don't use it. That was the moment where the guys were like, what? So he came with an idea that was not the brief, but it was inspiring these managers to think uh, over the, as we say here, as, as the, the end of the, 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 the plate. So they really, for the first time, they were like, wow, yeah. And they felt like as if somebody had shaken them. And the next, the rest of the presentation was good stuff, really very nice ideas. But as you say, the inspiration must be more than uh, fulfill the brief. So if they understand that you are very inspired creative, which uh, uh, approaches a problem from a totally different angle, which is hopefully interesting. This is uh, for him, uh, that he can make use of, of of his partner, of you. So that's that's the secret. As so amongst was... amongst many of the things that, that I think keep our people in our industry up at night, AI for one, um, Changing CMOs every week is another, you know, I think there, there are many things, but but there is one area I think that is has grown in concern and you've talked about it and that's in-house agencies. And I think that, you know, you were talking about companies that think they can be creative and what's our challenge. You know, I always believe that our best relationships are understanding that the clients know their business better than we do, but we know our business better than the clients. So when you, when you put together what we do best and what they do best, you have a great partnership. So we don't try to make the toothpaste, but yet clients are trying to make the advertising. So maybe just, just spend a couple of minutes talking about your view on in-house agencies and how best might we learn to partner with them, to deal with them, to understand them. It's a, uh, it's t absolutely like you say, it used to be a problem and still is. The same is this terrible invented by devil word collaboration <laughs> when clients want to come to workshops at the end of the day, want to have the creative solution. And uh, yeah, so, but in-house agencies, uh, uh, exactly as you say, 
terrible as well because um they call themselves creatives but they are only how to say they can't be totally creative why not because they are in the middle of the task the moment where they think they have to they have, they have no distance anymore so if you don't have a distance you cannot see things with fresh eyes and that's what we get money for i love in america maybe it was your company invented the sentence what i love is uh the the client says what and the agency says how and this is something what doesn't work if you're uh, as a creative in the middle of the of the um the how to say the business from your client how can they feel what everybody outside feels and that's why we are i was i love to say to clients nowadays um i'm uh, how to say i am not shy um, and i can i can uh, self conscious and i tell them you know that i don't know a lot about your company is the good thing and i try in the next cooperation with you i try not to lose it because that's what your consumers are as well so if i know ev knew everything about your technology and how you produce and where and why uh, this would be not good for the creative idea. How could it be good if it, I'm into the problem and not outside of the problem? Uh. Thank you. So let, let's move and let's just talk about a few pieces of work uh, before we summarize. And, you know, I'm, I'm just going to share with you a few pieces. We'll show them. So as we as we go through this, so people can see and we'll we'll help them link to them as well. Um but some of them were winners in this year's New York Festival, so we're very excited to to show them. Um, let's just talk about them and see what you think. So the first one I want to talk to is open to diversity. Germany, a country that is home to 24 million people with a migrant background, a country in which the vast majority agrees. Germany is diverse. Germany is multilingual, but the German federal president's highly symbolic Christmas address has been broadcast in just one language for 100 years. To honor the 100th anniversary, the Democracy Initiative Open to Diversity changed this. about this sensation, from their need to with the most inclusive Christmas address of all time. As a symbol of a diverse Germany, the initiative published the Christmas address on Christmas Day in the 12 most spoken languages in Germany. For the first time, people from all kinds of backgrounds were able to experience the federal president's speech in their own mother tongue. This made Frank Walter Steinmeier the first politician in the world to deliver a speech in several languages at the same time. How was this possible almost simultaneously? On December 25th, 2023 at 7.10 p.m., the speech was broadcast in Germany on TV as every year. An AI simultaneously translated the wording and adapted it to the president's linguistic style. Individuals consistently inform me about Imagine this. how inclusive our society could be if Frank Walter Steinmeier acts as a role model for politicians all around the world. When I heard this idea first, uh, I was so excited because, I mean, that's not only in Germany the case. We found out that in no other country in the world, the minister president uh, speaks various languages. They normally address in England. The queen would never speak anything else in English. Yeah. So, uh, but I found so cool because, as you say, in Germany, if you know it or not, or believe it or not, it's like 15 national, we have very many nationalities, uh, people from all over the world living here. So they kind of have their home here, but they don't feel at home in very, oft very often. So if the president holds a speech, and he just speaks German. How can all these people who just came here understand what he's talking about? And we have not even 
a poor uh, translation uh, on the screen. So the idea of the team was like, hey, we hijacked the speech. They just did it. They never asked anybody uh, and we just did it. Uh, so very courageous. They just took the speech and have kind of simultaneously, but a little bit it took to, to have the, the data transferred. And um, they tried not only to have the dubbing of the, the, the different languages in Mr. Steinmeier's um, way to talk, but also how he moves his characteristic eye movements and all that, but in the rhythm of the language. So I guess I'm, I don't, I speak only English, German, and little French, so I have no idea how Serbo Croatian um, pronunciations are, but they kind of made it perfect. And uh, so came that the first time in history, the German president uh, hold this speech in 15 languages simultaneously. So everybody could say, okay, I'm Turkish. We have a lot of Turkish uh, fellow citizens here. And so this was uh, really, a, how to say, what I liked about it so much is that it was a, incredible that it's the first time, but it was the first time. And and uh, we heard from other country as the, 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 the news like um, went. And uh, some of the other countries asked uh, how we did it. And the president said, he wants this now, uh, so he didn't. They didn't sue us, right? They said, "Yeah, okay, you did it, and I think it's cool." So, the next speeches will be done like that. He wants. I think it's amazing. The Pope does that, as you know. The Pope always ah, does ah, okay. Christmas, in, but he does it himself. He just reads. I just wanted to say he's uh, he's, so he's smart. yeah, yeah he's so cool. smart. So another but, another piece that spoke. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. I just want to say you feel personally addressed if somebody addresses you in your language so it's just a complete different emotion and uh, I think it's only clever to be as a president for all his citizens uh, uh, an important person not only to the Germans which are like we are not so many Germans anymore so it's only only good for him to do that yeah I I I, I loved it it just spoke it spoke to me too so I think it was great um, another another piece that, that I loved was Rights Against Rights. Since the rise of Adolf Hitler, Germany's right-wing movement hasn't been as strong as today. At its forefront, Nazi organizations that spread hatred and violence against anyone they oppose. One of their biggest sources of funding, merchandise. Shirts and jumpers printed with coded messages. Codes that allow them to escape prosecution and spread their hateful messages effectively. Victors! Where the lawmaker is incapable of acting with bans, we found a simple hack to legally shut down Nazi codes for the first time ever by using the trademark law. Together with the NGO Laut gegen Nazis, we secured trademark rights for Nazi codes at the European Trademark Office. As the new rightful trademark owners, we can now make sellers remove and destroy anything bearing these codes and demand compensation for each item sold. Money we use to secure the rights to even more extremist codes and turn Nazis into funders against Nazi messages. But not only extremists generated funds for our initiative. Donations for Laut gegen Nazis from all over the world reached record heights, as has the awareness for the NGO's cause. Covered by national and international media, our legal hack to outsmart Nazis took news outlets by storm, achieving over 2.2 billion media impressions. A small NGO just outsmarted some big Nazi online shops. Content networks and influencers immediately jumped on our campaign, turning their followers into supporters. Millions of people loved, liked, discussed, and shared our idea, increasing search requests by over 630% and sparking public debate. The greatest news of all? All Nazi shops reacted and have already removed the merchandise bearing our codes. But this is only the beginning. With many more trademarks already in publication, we continue together with Laut gegen Nazis to stop one of Nazis' biggest sources of funding. And uh, yeah, and so the idea was uh, simple but uh, complicated at the same time. We, um, what you must know is that the German Nazis have abbreviations because it's forbidden to write Hitler on your t-shirt. You write HTR. So for all the, the, the right neo-Nazis, it's clear that this is Hitler. So you have T-shirts with H-E-R and all the other abbreviations. And it's very common and very 
uh, and they, they buy a lot of this stuff. So the idea was pretty simple to, to uh, buy the rights for these approvations and the designs. So they went to the German, um, how do you say, um, government, not government, um, the offices and bought the rights. So every T-shirt, which is now being sold by Nazis to Nazis, they have to pay, right? Um, money to to this um, wonderful uh, organization, Loud Against Nazis. So they we kind of cut off or took a big uh, how say part of the revenues of the Nazis to support <laughs> the anti-Nazi <laughs> um, of um, organization, which is cool. So we I, yeah, great. So now we'll move to something that's a little more commercial. We all know that one of the big issues with autonomous cars is that people are scared of them. Um, there have been accidents and there have been all kinds of stories. Some of them are true, some of them are not, but it doesn't matter because even the ones that are true are a little horrific and people are scared. The idea of giving a car a driving test is spectacular. When I put it in auto drive, that's when it really freaks me out. We have new details tonight on the dangers they may pose. How can I rely on a car to make the right decision? I would say I am a best driver than a computer. I would never get in a car that doesn't have a driver. Self-driving cars just don't uh, work. So the development of autonomous vehicles has come a long way. This technology has been tested and validated. There's huge benefit for a lot of people. Taking the driver out of the driver's seat, I feel like is a very big leap. I think the tech is here. The people are here. I'm Candace Jones, a certified drive examiner for the DMV. I've been doing it for about 25 years. I have failed thousands and thousands of students in the interest of public safety. And we're gonna get this started. It's gonna be the same criteria, just like testing a human. We'll be monitoring the speed, how it does a lane change. Nice. I'm gonna grade maneuvers. Making a complete stop, we have left turn. Perfect left turn. And of course, reaction time is very important. Well, their hands are full. I'm impressed. So I'm giving it a thumbs up. Driver's license is going to become a thing of the past. Hyundai had the robot taxi go through a DMV driving train. Train a robot taxi to be this safe. I love the idea because, um, as you say, it's a kind of final proof that this car acts like a human being in a way. So uh, to to put this to a driving license test in Las Vegas, this was done. This was an official, uh, official, sorry, an official, um, yeah, person, a driver, driving teacher which had a lot of experience. I mean, in Germany, 30% of the um, do you say applicants as people who want to get this driving license fail? Uh, in in America, it's in, in Las Vegas. It was like I think twenty five, but uh, and you you are witnessing in this case when you are witnessing uh, the driving test this car is going through, and the very end it gets this driving license. We thought it's the final, hopefully one of the how to say a good argument or a final proof that the car can. Um, move uh, as um yeah as good as a man sitting in this car uh, in a city so las vegas of course was cool because these robo taxis are there, uh, driving around and we love the idea that a car makes the driving license gets the driving license yeah and um i don't know if the time is already if you are already to to go the next step and try to start to trust these vehicles, but uh, it was a big step, I think, in that direction. 
I don't know. Do you would you drive an uh, an autom autonomous car? You yourself? Oh, would I drive in one? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I think it would depend where. I'm not sure I would do it on the highway yet. For a long drive at fast speeds, but I would in the city. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was sitting in a Tesla test drive, and uh, what I didn't know that the guy um, stopped. Also the the guy, the the salesperson, uh, he stopped to 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 um, maneuver himself, and uh, was doing this. <laughs> I said, "What's going on?" He said, "Yes, we just want to show you how well our." autonomous driving um skills work and uh, then the car the car decided to change lane and this was uh, i was completely surprised and shocked because the car just did uh what he saw the car thought uh, is better because kind of ahnung i don't know what what um, why but this was a very um um yeah strange experience the car does oh. what it wants for sure, for sure. But it's one that we're all going to have to get used to. And again, I think the notion of of giving a car a driving license is something so clever and so so simple. Again, all all great ideas are simple. Yeah. All great ideas make you wonder, gee, why didn't I think of that? And I think that to me, that's always one of my key filters. And all the ideas that we just talked about are in that realm of, just brilliant simplicity, but beautifully executed, well messaged, and makes sense. So thank you for for sharing those uh, those beautiful piece of work. And in general, Dote, thank you so much for for joining me on creativity from the other side. Is a you know you're a, a now an FOD, a friend of David, and you will get a very special T shirt from. Right. New York Festivals with a little FOD hidden on it. Thank you. I, I would love to go on with this conversation. Maybe we, we meet each other next time. And you are, I guess, in New York or where are you based? Sure. Well, if you're in New York, for sure. And if I come to Germany, for sure, as well. And um, I think I, 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 mean I it, really enjoy talking to you and I love doing the research. And I just want to remind everybody, we talked about we talked about the, the importance of mentorship. Um the importance of mentoring young women in the in the industry and making sure that women mentor women because i think it's important for people to see to have a, a a vision of what they can become and you know dote when we look at you as the chairwoman of jung van matt the first in germany i think that all over the world young women should have should be inspired by by what you've done we talked about being a copywriter, but having the notion or the ability to visualize and to understand what what goes into creating good advertising visually as well as the words. And I think if you can put those together, it's great. We talked about entrepreneurship and how sometimes that can just, you can be someplace for a hundred years. But if you've been an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur inside, every day is different and every day is new. And I think that's an important lesson for everyone. We talked about the pitch and how not to be a grouch, how to leave your ego at the door, why it's important, inspiring people throughout. Um, we talked about in-house agencies and don't be scared. Just you're creative people out there. That's what we do. We're, we're good at what we do. Don't take second place we're good at what we do our clients are good at what they do that's why they're our clients and we just need to be confident enough to allow our clients to be clients and for us to be their partners and i think that will that will will do well so dote thank you so much again danke schön and i look forward to to meeting you in person and and being yeah, with you, you having a chance and please Tell your family we say hello and give Tyson a good, nice, special pet for us. I will. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Hope As well. So, friends, on behalf of New York Festivals, this is David Sable bringing you creativity from the other side where we talk 
to the most interesting and incredible people as we did today with Dorte. And stay tuned. We got way more coming. Thank you.